Well, as you've heard me say many, many times, I had a great relationship with my daddy. From the moment, um, my very first memories of him until his dying day, I loved him deeply and enjoyed his company and always wanted to please him. I rarely ever lied to him. I'm being honest there. Uh, Because I loved him and I wanted to be honest with him. And when I wasn't, things just seemed off. Uh, And it seemed like he knew when how could he know but he just knew without ever even me telling him anything and how do parents know that right how do parents do that my daughter once said to me mom we could never lie to you because you always knew I don't know if I always knew but she thought I always knew so that was great (laughs) but once some of you parents probably don't want your kids to hear this but once the summer after my freshman year in high school I did something really stupid my parents were out of town and my grandparents were staying with me and I told them I was spending the night with a friend and my friend told her parents that she was spending the night with me I know, is that horrible? I did that. And we went running around town. But we got caught, of course. And my grandparents showed up at one of the places we were. My wonderful Presbyterian minister grandfather. And it was horrible. And But what was even worse was admitting it to my daddy when he came back into town. And you know, he wasn't angry. He was just sad. Very, very sad. I disappointed him and I'd hurt him. And so together we sat down, we decided what the consequences would be for my behavior. And so I was grounded for a month. Um, Except, well, there was this big concert coming to town. And I already had tickets for it and a date for it. And so my dad said, okay, I'll let you go for one hour to the concert and I will pick you up. I had a horrible time during that one hour at the concert. The whole time I was there, I was feeling guilty that I'd lied to my grandparents of all things. Probably would have, my dad would probably been less mad if I'd only lied to him, not my grandparents too, but it was my mother's parents. Um, And I felt guilty that I'd let my dad down. And here I was at this concert, supposed to be having a good time, and it was horrible. Well, as I walked out of the concert, this was when it was at Municipal Auditorium in Austin, Texas. Some of y'all are shaking your heads. And I remember walking down that long sidewalk, and there he was waiting for me. And as soon as I saw him, I just fell into his arms and sobbed. And I said, I am so sorry. I have not been (laughs) behaving. I've been really stupid. Can you forgive me? And I remember him just hugging me and saying, of course, I love you, Nancy. And it was a real turning point in my life because I was starting to head in a a not-so-healthy direction. And I did change direction. You know, every one of us does stupid things uh, at times and things that really damage our relationship with people we love. More importantly, things that damage our relationship with God. It's okay, we can clean the floor. Well, today we heard a story about someone who had done something really bad. And he felt really guilty, but he hid his guilt and shame until somebody came and called him out on it. Now, the person I'm talking about was King David. Now, David was a hero from a very early age. Remember how he took down the giant Goliath with just a slingshot and a pebble when he was only a boy? He went on to become a conquering military hero. He was an artist and a poet. Years ago when I went to Bethlehem, one of the first things that God told us was, we have two hometown hometown boys who made it big, David and Jesus. It's kind of cute. In the Old Testament, there are 62 chapters devoted to King David. There are 60 references in the New Testament to David. In fact, Scripture tells us that he is a man after God's own heart. But when we hear his story, we think, huh. Because when we meet up with him today, he's king of Israel, and he's rich, and he's powerful, and he's successful, and he's well-respected. But he let all the success go to his head, and he had abused his power, 
and he had lied and manipulated things, and he had committed adultery, and he had even had someone killed. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a man after God's own heart, does it? Well, you probably remember the story. About a year before what we read today, uh, King David was walking around the roof of his house in Jerusalem, and he notices who? Bathsheba, beautiful Bathsheba, who is taking a bath on the roof of her house. And he discovers she's married to someone, not just anybody, but a general in his own army. No problem, he's king, right? So he sends for her to make a long story short. Of course, she ends up pregnant. But there's a problem, you see, because her husband has been in battle, not at home. So everyone would know that somebody had misbehaved. So David calls Uriah home from battle, and he brings him in and just, you know, chats him up about how wonderful life is and battle go, and, you know, go home and see your wife. But the problem is... Uriah sleeps outside on the doorstep and he says, the Ark of the Covenant is still in the tent and my fellow soldiers are out fighting in the battlefield. How could, how could I possibly go home and share a meal and be with my wife? It just wouldn't be right. David tries again. In fact, he gets him really, really drunk and Uriah still does not go home to his wife. So finally, David calls in the commander of his troops. He said, I want you to send Uriah to the front lines of battle. And when the battle's really tough, pull everybody back except for Uriah. Needless to say, Uriah is killed in battle. Well, when Bathsheba finds out that her husband is killed, the scripture tells us she mourns for the appropriate period of time. Then she goes to the to palace and becomes another one of David's many wives and bears his son. Now this has taken some time. Now God, who has blessed David tremendously, knows exactly what David has done, even though David has not told anybody. And in probably one of the greatest uh, understatements in the Bible, it says that God is displeased. <laughs> And God allows David to sit with his deceit and his lying and his sin and struggle with it for months. And after the child is born, God sends a prophet, Nathan, to talk to the king. Now, Nathan is a really wise man because he knows if he goes, just goes straight to him and says, what did you do? Uh, that's not going to quite get the message across. So he tells him this parable, and that's a parable that Wayne read for us this morning. You know, Jesus would do the same thing frequently. He would tell parables because he wanted people to examine their own hearts. Parables would get people to think about themselves. So Nathan tells this parable about a lamb. And pet lambs are really popular in Israel. Lots of people had pet lambs. And David would be sensitive to that because at one time he had been a shepherd. So Nathan tells this story of a poor man who had a pet lamb and he'd bought it with his hard-earned money and he loved it so much that that little lamb was allowed to eat at the family table and sleep in the family sleeping chamber. And in this story, there was also a rich man who had lots and lots and lots and lots of lambs. One day, a traveler stopped by to see this rich man and the rich man didn't want to share one of his sheep so he stole the poor man's only lamb and made it into dinner for his guest. Now, as David heard the story, he just growls with anger at the wickedness of this rich man in the parable. He was so sure this story was about somebody else's incident. And isn't it amazing how quick David was to see the sin of this imaginary man. It doesn't even cross his mind that he actually is a man in that story. One time years ago, someone suggested to me that anytime people get really angry at the sins of other people, maybe, just maybe, it's because of the same or, same or similar sin in their own lives. Ever since then, when I find myself really angry, like when I hear something on the news about somebody who's done something horrible, or I hear some story in the church about somebody who's done something that seems bad, and I get angry, I immediately say, God, why am I so angry? And is there something inside of me that I need to deal with? And I hate it 
when I realize that often there is, you know, that I need to deal with some stuff. You know, we don't often want to see or admit our own sin. Jesus reminds us of this very thing when centuries later he says, why do you see the speck that is someone else's eye but don't even notice the log in your own? Take the log out of your own eye first. I have a friend who calls this the log syndrome. He's a pastor. And when we're in a meeting with a bunch of pastors and people are, you know, always, you know how it is. You get together with other professionals in your area and everybody's talking about how other professionals in your area are doing things wrong. And he says, he'll be sitting there and all of a sudden I hear him say, log. (laughs) And I'll look over and he'll just wink, you know. Log in the eye, yes, log. It just cracks me up. So now when I hear y'all say that, log, when you see... We need to get the log out of our own eye before we start trying to get the speck out of someone else's. So David, uh, Nathan uses uh, that human nature of David uh, to always see the fault of someone else to get his attention. And it's really ironic that David thinks that the rich man should be executed for his cruelty. Because you see, the Mosaic law said that the penalty for both adultery and murder is death. David deserves death. And he is pronouncing death on this other person. And Nathan then utters those really painful, painful words. And, you know, I can just picture him with a trembling voice and tears running down his cheek as he said, David, don't you see You are the man. Uriah had a little lamb named Bathsheba. And you weren't content with a harem full of wives. So you wanted what wasn't yours. And to win her, you had stopped at nothing, not even adultery nor murder. Can you even imagine how David felt in that moment? Both Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, we read 51 earlier, were written during this time. And in Psalm 32, David says, While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as heat by the summer. All those months when he hadn't told anybody what was going on, as he watched Bathsheba's abdomen swell with their child, he was miserable. God allowed him to feel the weight of his sin. So by the time Nathan comes to him, he's devastated when Nathan says, David, you despise the word of the Lord. But in an amazing response, David says, very simply, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, David may have been a great sinner, but he is a great repenter. He doesn't blame anybody else. He doesn't say she shouldn't have been taking that bath out on the roof. He doesn't whine about his repressed childhood or that his mother was to blame. If she had only let him do whatever, he wouldn't have been attracted to somebody taking a bath on the roof. He doesn't complain that he was the youngest of eight children and had been mistreated his whole life. Didn't always get what he wanted, so he had to have this. He just said, I sinned against God. And immediately, Nathan's response is to lift the death sentence. Nathan will not, I mean, David will not receive the death sentence. David writes, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not hide my iniquity. I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And he writes, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven. You see, even though David sinned largely, He is still known as a man after God's own heart in the scriptures. And he's also known as the greatest king of Israel. And we think, huh? How can that be? That can be because God's grace is bigger and wider and deeper than any of David's sins. And God's grace is bigger and wider and deeper than any of your sins or my sins. You know, just as my daddy loved me and wanted me to be honest with him, God wants that even more from you and me. 
And you know, the truth of the matter is he already knows. We think we're hiding it from him, and we are miserable when we do that. When we're not honest, we're just as miserable as I was when I went to the concert I thought I wanted to go to and was so miserable because I hadn't been reconciled with my father. What matters most is reconciled relationships. Yes, with the people we're here with, but most importantly, with God. And you know, it's so easy that it's hard. God did all the hard stuff. He came and lived among us in the person of Jesus. And then he suffered and died. He gave his life so that all of our sins would be forgiven. We just have to recognize that. We just have to accept that. You know, God just wants us to look inside ourselves. Actually, he wants us to invite him to look inside ourselves. Years and years ago, I was teaching a confirmation class, and and we were looking at the prayers of the Bible, and I had the kids say which prayer they wouldn't want to pray, and one of the prayers was, Lord, search me and try me and see if there's any wicked ways in me. And the kids said, I would never pray that prayer. And I said, why? And they said, I don't want God looking and knowing what's inside of me. I said, well, guess what? He already does. See, God wants us to invite him to search us and see if there's something in us, because sometimes we can't recognize that. And call it to our attention. And then we can say, wow, I have sinned against you, God. I am so sorry. Forgive me. And God will wash us whiter than snow. God will create in us a clean heart. And let me tell you, it feels really good when that heart is clean. So I challenge you this week, look in a mirror. Ask God to look inside of you. See if there's anything that you need to confess and then do it. Because God's grace and his love is so much bigger and wider and deeper than anything you could have possibly have done or thought. He wants to forgive you and wrap you in his loving arms and let you know he loves you. What good news. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you love us that much. It's hard for us to realize that kind of love. So just open our hearts to receive your love. Help us to lay before you all our sins and allow us to let you just wash them till they're whiter than snow. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.